I would, I'd like to thank everybody for joining me this afternoon. I'd like to thank AMPR for giving me the opportunity to speak today at this conference. And I'd also like to give a shout out to everybody who's watching this broadcast at home on explore.org. So if you want to share this broadcast with anybody, this will be, uh, this is being live streamed right now on our webcams and at the same time. Um, it'll be uploaded to uh, Explore.org's YouTube channel, so you can watch a replay or share it with anybody um, there. My name uh, is, is Mike Pitts. I was a park ranger uh, in total at nine different national parks in a variety of positions, but mostly as an interpretive ranger. So uh, in most of my experience here at Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska, has anybody had the opportunity, been fortunate enough to visit there? Okay, good, all right, excellent, so a few of you. Uh, this is uh, one of the most spectacular places for wildlife watching, really in North America and perhaps the world. So it's world famous for its bear viewing uh, opportunities. And today I want to talk about how we can bring you know, those different bear watching opportunities to, well, the rest of the world. Uh, so I am no longer a national park ranger, I, I work for explore.org, which is the world's largest live nature cam network. Uh, it's a philanthropic organization. We partner with public and private organizations to make live streaming webcams freely available to, to the public. Uh, we have about 100 different webcams, mostly in the United States, but also in several different areas of the world. In fact, our newest live cam is the uh, Grace Gorillas camera in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which I am very excited. You can watch gorillas at a rescue center there. Uh, and, you know, it, the most popular webcams that we have for Explore.org are the bear cams at Katmai. And I'll talk about why that is just a little bit uh, later on. But also importantly, Katmai, and especially Brooks River, is sort of a microcosm for a lot of the issues that national parks face today. Issues associated with skyrocketing visitation and crowding, issues associated with impacts that visitation has on park resources and the things that make uh, these places special. And I wanna you know, kind of posit a question to everybody and that is how do we continue to provide high quality park experiences to people visiting these places and at the same time protecting the resources that make them special? There's no easy answer to that question, but I propose that webcams can be a big part of at least uh, the solution, a part of that solution. And how do we get to this point? You know, as many of you have worked in national parks before, you understand and you know that a physical visit to a national park is a very powerful experience. And early park managers, early superintendents realized this as well. And they realized that if we got people into parks, that they would have an exceptional experience. They would become constituents for these places and they would become stewards and advocates for their continued protection. And that's why many parks were developed with roads, trails, visitor centers, hotels, lodges. They were staffed with friendly people to have, to, so people could have a high quality experience. And that paradigm was very successful, and Katmai followed that paradigm as well, only on a slightly smaller scale. Katmai was never developed uh, to the same level as parks in the contiguous United States. But the bear cam, or excuse me, the, the bear viewing experience at Katmai is exceptionally powerful. For me, you know, walking up to uh, Brooks Falls and seeing bears there when you're walking up on that wildlife viewing platform, it's like walking to the rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, for me, it's on that same level of an experience. It's something that you're not likely to forget. So this paradigm of park visitation is, uh, is very powerful. Uh, so if you can physically visit a park, it's a, it's a very memorable experience for you. However, the paradigm this paradigm of getting people physically in national parks is not inclusive to everybody. There are a lot of barriers that people face to visiting national parks. So that's one issue that I want to try to talk about during, during the talk today. One of the other issues though, especially at Katmai, is that when you visit this place, you're, in a sense, you're changing it. 
Uh, Katmai, first of all, can't sustain unlimited visitation, and then um, many of the uh, animals in Katmai are especially sensitive to, uh, the, uh, to the presence of people, especially brown bears. So this is what I like to call the paradox of park visitation. There, even in, like in quantum, uh, quantum mechanics and quantum physics, uh, there's that principle that if you observe you know, uh, you know, electrons or protons or some of those, those tiny particles, you can change the behavior of that particle. Well, the same thing happens with brown bears. So again, this is, the par this is the paradox that a lot of national parks are facing. And again, and the question is, how do we continue to provide high quality park experiences for everybody, while at the same time protecting the resources that make these places very special? And webcams, I think, can be part of that solution. So you enter the bear cams. This is one of this is just a scene from our underwater camera that we have at Brooks River. So really uh, a unique and remarkable experience in its own right. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of how webcams can be part of this solution and help make parks more relevant to more people and more inclusive, uh, let me introduce you to Katmai a bit more thoroughly. Where is this place? Because it's not a place that a lot of people visit. Katmai National Park is uh, located, of course, not really anywhere where we are. It's uh, located 1,500 miles or 2,000 miles north or so on the northern end of the Alaska Peninsula. It's the fourth largest national park in the United States, just over 3.7 million acres in size. It's a remote, spectacular region. There's one road that kind of goes somewhere in Katmai, but there are no roads really connecting to it. So I mean, access is through plane or boat. And Brooks River itself is the most visited area in the park, but it's actually a very small part of, uh, of the overall landscape. And Brooks River is bisected by world famous uh, Brooks Falls. And if you've ever seen a picture of a bear catching a fish at a waterfall, you've seen, probably seen Brooks Falls. That's, that's where it happens to be located. Long before this place became a tourist destination, however, uh, Katmai was first protected for its volcanic resources, specifically the area surrounding the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, the site of the world's largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century, and the fifth largest volcanic eruption in, uh, in recorded history. But if you're thinking of Katmai now, are you thinking of volcanoes? What's the first thing that pops in your brain? Bears. Bears, right? Yeah, so bears are Katmai's flagship species. There's a lot of things that make Katmai National Park a very special place, but bears are the thing that people think of most often. In fact, there are more brown bears in Katmai estimated than all of the grizzlies in the lower 48. So at last estimate, uh, and the estimate's about 10 years old now, a little over 10 years old, there were about 2,200 brown bears estimated to live either, either wholly or partly within the park boundaries. So this is one of the largest and densest uh, populations of, of brown bears anywhere on Earth. And the most popular place in the park to see brown bears happens to be Brooks River. And this is it, this is the entirety of Brooks River, just a mile and a half long, uh, it's, uh, it gets anywhere from, over the past uh, four years, anywhere from 10 to 14,000 people per year. And while that doesn't sound like a lot when you compare it to the visitation levels that a lot of parks, other, other national parks experience, this is a very intensely managed place. Because uh, you can have, on the busiest days in July, several hundred people roaming around here, generally unrestricted, and two to three dozen brown bears. So there's a lot going on in this, in this small uh, location. The experience there is very profound, however. It's um, very uh, meaningful to the people. It's, it's, it's memorable. It's something that you're not likely to forget. And it's just not view, viewing bears up at Brooks Falls. It's actually the fact of, you know, that you're seeing bears pretty much everywhere. Uh, you see them outside the lodge. You see them on the beach when you get off your plane. They're outside the campground. They're outside your cabins. They're on the trails that you walk to to get to different places. So you have a, a really incredible wildlife watching opportunity and a really incredible experience to be around uh, these large animals. So who is visiting this place? Who is, who is, um, who is visiting uh, Katmai itself? The typical Brooks Camp visitor uh, generally is from, you know, fairly high income levels. Uh, so about, um, you know, uh, uh, from an in-depth visitor survey that was conducted in the summer of uh, 2014, 
about 25% uh, of people said that their household income was greater than $200,000 a year. And 45% of people were in between $75,000 and $199,000 household income. So generally, you know, high middle to upper income households visiting the park. And the demographics aren't necessarily what, uh, are a reflection of a larger American population as a whole. Mostly in groups of two, mostly of the baby, baby boomer population. And of course, what do they come in to see? Well, that is a little obvious. Well, they're, they're coming to see bears. Uh, you know, I put eight out of 10 icons over there in the corner of bears because about 80% of people in this visitor survey identified bear watching as specifically the thing that they came to Katmai to see. So uh, another, I think 14% came to fish. So fishing is a popular activity at, oh, excuse me, at Katmai. Um, but only like two or three percent of people identified something else besides fishing or bear watching. So bears are really the thing that attract uh, people's attention. I want to kind of ignore the popularity of bears for a moment and go back to some of that demographic information. Because why are we seeing generally people from higher income households visiting Katmai? It's because it's ridiculously expensive to get there. When you look at, when you compare the cost of visiting Mount Rainier in the summer to the cost of visiting Yellowstone in the winter to the cost of visiting Katmai in the summer, those other two parks don't compare. I chose Mount Rainier as an example because that's close to an urban population. You can get there and back in a day from Seattle or Tacoma or Olympia. So you don't, um, you know, if you're spending money in and around the park, you don't have to spend a whole lot of money to get there. Yellowstone in the winter time takes a bit more effort, right? Um, it's ex you have to, you know, to get into the into the park, you have to hire like a snow coach or a guide on a snowmobile. Uh, so that costs a good chunk of change, about over almost eight hundred dollars per person, uh, you know, to visit Yellowstone in the winter. But again, it doesn't even compare to what it costs Katmai. Per group, and the average group size, about 50% of the groups that responded to this survey were groups of two. Per group, $7,600. And then about $3,700 per individual to visit Alaska and to visit Katmai. And you know, this number probably does include uh, you know, money spent not in the Katmai region. It probably also includes money spent on, a, on the rest of, of an Alaska trip. But even if you were just to take in Air, or take airfare into consideration. Airfare to get to Katmai from Anchorage, you're looking at about $700 per person round trip. So again, this is just not an experience that is accessible to most of the public. And even if you can overcome that financial barrier, there's a lot of other barriers that people experience to visit Katmai. Maybe you don't like to fl fly in small planes. Maybe uh, you know, there are physical barriers um, that you experience. Whatever it happens to be, there's just a lot of barriers that prevent people from physically experiencing this place. And that's probably the same for a lot of the national parks that you have worked in or visited in the past. And then of course, there's also that paradox, that paradox of visitation. Rangers at Brooks Camp and Katmai work really hard to keep people physically separated from bears, but that doesn't mean that um, the presence of people isn't altering the behavior and the movement of, of the animals itself. Because you can classify brown bears into different like ages and whether they're male or female or a mom with cubs or whatever. But brown bears can also be classified into different groups depending on their tolerance for people. So not all brown bears are very habituated to the presence of people. In fact, those brown bears aren't more dangerous. They're just not gonna use the Brooks River area. And Brooks River is one of the most important places for bears to fish for salmon in central Katmai, especially very early in the salmon run uh, in June and July, and also very late in the salmon run in September and October. So people do have an impact on the distribution and the movement of brown bears at Brooks River. So if we were to think about making that park experience more inclusive, again, you can't really shove more people into this small space and not have a significant impact on the wildlife that you're coming to see. So how do we bridge those barriers, break the paradox? Well, we want to utilize, I think, webcams. Webcams were identified uh, in the Katmai National Park's Long Range Interpretive Plan in 2009. And then in 2012, Katmai National Park entered into a 
a partnership with explore.org to bring live streaming webcams. And this is live right now, so there's a bear fishing at the waterfall right now. This is not recorded footage. So, uh, you know, when we're sharing this experience, it's just not us in this room watching this. We're sharing this experience with people all over the world. Uh, and there, so there's just not, you know, the Brooks Falls webcam. This is the most popular webcam uh, at the river, but there's a whole host of others at, uh, at the river. So um, two, two to three webcams available at Brooks Falls, depending on bandwidth and what's available. And then also several at the mouth of Brooks River, uh, giving different perspectives on the ecology, the salmon, and the wildlife of the area. The webcams are installed to existing infrastructure, and they're just like security cameras that are hooked up to the internet. Uh, you, if you look around, I'm sure they might they probably have some at this hotel that looks just like this. So they can pan, they can tilt, they can zoom. There's an army of actually volunteer camera operators working behind the, zine, the, behind the scenes to follow uh, brown bears. The cameras at the mouth of Brooks River are tied into the electrical grid, the, gener the diesel generators that power Brooks Camp. And the cameras at the falls are powered by solar energy, so they're off the grid uh, there. Once the webcams went live on the internet, it was pretty clear that they were very popular, and they have really only grown in popularity since that time. Looking at the last fiscal year, federal fiscal year, um, when you look at the bear cam statistics, 18.6 million page views on the bear cams, 9.2 million unique page views, and I think those are important numbers to contrast because that means a lot of people are returning each and every, uh, uh, you know, throughout the year to watch the webcams. And 84.5 um, million minutes streamed this year. I did the math on that. That's about 162 years of bear watching. So <laughs> a lot of people watching a lot of bears. And then finally, uh, it's viewed in all 50 states and 120 countries. So we're reaching a worldwide audience with our webcams. And an important part of the webcam experience is actually uh, the uh, is our online interpretive efforts. Uh, I, I believe that this is a very uh, important part of the webcam experience, helping people understand what they're seeing, discussing the current events on the on the bear cams. This is a, a chat from a couple years ago. This is myself um, and Ranger uh, Andrew Laval, who is now at uh, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, so very talented interpretive ranger. Uh, we're up on Dumpling Mountain, which we also have a webcam uh, located there. So that's an important part of the process, and I, I want to bring that idea back in, in just a little bit. But one of the things, you know, through our online interpretive efforts and looking at the comments that a lot of these, um, these chats end up receiving, uh, and just looking at the comments of how people were, were reacting to the bears, the wildlife that they're seeing on the camera, we were getting a lot of comments that seemed to suggest that the webcam experience was actually really powerful. Uh, comments like this. Until I found this cam from explore.org, I had never given our national parks much thought at all. This cam has given me a window into a world that I would never be able to see in person and a much greater appreciation of our national parks and the need for them to be preserved. So the webcam seemed to be, at least for this person, successful in, in raising awareness and appreciation for our national parks. Other people move that maybe even a step further into action and stewardship. Uh, Stacy says, the bear cams inspired me to want to become a park ranger. And she's actually come to Katmai, come to Brooks River for the past two summers and volunteered her time to, uh, with the interpretive division at Brooks River. So it has um, inspired her into action. And then there's also evidence that um, the, the webcams are being used for education and learning opportunities. A teacher that commented on the bear camp had this uh, to say about a couple of her students. She said, the playground monitor brought two of my boys in from recess for biting. Evidently, they were pretending the climbing wall was Brooks Falls. <laughs> they, and they thought they were Otis and Ted. The monitor didn't think it was very funny, and neither did I. Somebody actually replied, I think it's funny, sorry. <laughs> and I actually laughed when I read that too. And then the, the teacher said, you know, afterwards I did too. They were really pretending. They went as far as to tell the assistant principal that Otis always has his spot and Ted shouldn't have moved in. And Ted and Otis are a couple of bears that were seen at Brooks Falls at the time. So those kids were paying attention, at least, to what was going on at the waterfall. 
I became, uh, and, and uh, you know, again, when I was a ranger there at Katmai, I became very uh, curious about, you know, whether these were just, were these anecdotes, or was this something that was more reflective of a larger webcam audience? Or th is this reflective of a, a larger pattern? Uh, so uh, in 2015 and 2016, some researchers from Kansas State University conducted a survey of online and on-site visitors uh, to compare and contrast the experience and how the, uh, you know, watching bears at Brooks Falls physically compares to the online experience when you're watching it over the internet. Oop, I keep doing that. Uh, and they found some similarities and some differences. They found that about one of the similarities is that very few people who either watched the webcams or visited it in person had been there to Katmai before. So only 16% of the on-site audience had visited before, and only 7% of the online audience had been to Katmai. So generally, people in both places, no matter where you happen to be, you probably have never been to Katmai. One of the big differences was in income. So 48% uh, of the on-site audience uh, reported an income of over $100,000, uh, household income, but only 21% of the online audience. So again, a, a disparity between the two groups there. There's also some disparities in how much time they're actually spending watching bears. I was really surprised to see that the on-site visitors only spent nine hours watching bears over three days when they're on the, of their visit. What, I don't know what they're doing otherwise. Drinking at the lodge or something, I don't know. I spend more, not more than nine hours a day than that uh, when I'm every day practically watching bears when I'm, when I'm at Brooks River. So uh, not a whole lot of time, uh, but compare that to the online audience. They're watching, uh, of the over 5,600 respondents, 85 minutes per visit to Explore to Oregon. It's like watching a TV show for, uh, for many folks. They tune in, they watch for significant periods of time. And importantly, 79% watched at least once per day during peak season, so they're coming back each year, Katmai and Brooks River is a part of their daily lives. But how does this translate into conservation and support for national parks? I think that's an important question to try to answer. And while we don't know for sure, we have some evidence that seems to suggest that the webcam experience is actually just as meaningful as an on-site visit. And those are some of the questions that we tried to answer in that survey in 2015 and 2016, and also a survey that we had going on the bear cams this summer. From that earlier survey from a few years ago, when asked whether the bear cam um, viewing experience, how that affected your emotional response to the animals uh, in a positive way, and um, it's your support and awareness of the species, you know, the on-site audience and online audience answered those questions basically on par. So did the bears I, uh, the bears I saw today increase my connection to the species? On a scale of one to nine, with nine being strongly agree, uh, the respondents were just about uh, number seven on that scale, so almost on par. And it was the same for the rest of these questions as well. Right around seven or so, increased support for parks and protected areas. Actually, the, the bear, brown bear viewing experience through the webcams um, exceeded uh, the, the number for the on-site visitors. Increased understanding of the U.S. National Park Service role in preservation on par uh, answers to, those, to that question. Increased interest in wildlife conservation, again, uh, on par for both audiences. And increased interest in visiting other national parks. So again, the experience online seems to solicit a, uh, an awareness and appreciation for national parks and brown bears That's, uh, that, is, um, that is on par with an on-site experience. But what about uh, protections for brown bears? What if, uh, you know, let's say you wanted to implement something that would give bears a greater level of protection? You know, would people who visit the parks be in support of those things? And would the people of the online audience who are watching online be in support of those things? And they found that the, actually, the online audience was actually much more supportive of, the, uh, of hypothetical protections for brown bears. And again, this is not something that the park was proposing but uh, something that had been in management plans and brought up in the past. So um, would you support limiting recreation if it has a positive impact for brown bears? Again, on a scale of one to nine, um, almost all of them were above seven and the online audience was generally much more supportive of that statement. 
Would you support limiting viewing locations if it has a positive impact for brown bears? Yes and yes, but more so for the online audience. Would you support limiting access if it has a positive impact on brown bears? Yes and yes. And would you forego a visit if it has a positive impact on brown bears? And again, the online audience answered that at a higher level, a higher level of support. So again, it, you know, it's maybe a little bit easy to just say, to say yes to a question that's hypothetical when it's not actually impacting you personally. Um, I think the numbers might be different if you were at Brooks River or you couldn't experience Brooks River in the same way because there was limited, more limited access to that place. So we don't really know for sure. But again, it does, these questions do, the answers to these questions do lend support to the fact that an online experience can increase uh, people's appreciation for conservation and their support for conservation efforts. This summer, we tried to dive a little bit deeper into, um, into some other questions associated with the webcam experience and how it's impacting people. Uh, so we had an online survey. So far, it has had over 5,700 respondents, um, from, mostly from North America, but from every continent in the world except Antarctica, um, which you can probably figure out why. And I was very curious in this survey in particular to ask about the, the online interpretation efforts. You know, how do those impact people's experiences? And we found that a significant number of people are actually uh, tuning in and joining these online programs. So our play-by-play -play broadcasts, um, about one out of five people are joining those. Our live chats, uh, about a fourth of the audience are joining those. I'll talk about the different types of those programs in a little bit. Our program replays, a lot of people are watching those, 24%. And our text chats, where we get into the comments and we, uh, and we talk directly with people. Um, about a tenth of the people are participating in, in those. And even if um, you know, this isn't reflective of the 9.2 million unique views, even if we could, it, it had to scale it down to even 10% of the online audience, that means that we're still reaching over 900,000 people through these online programs. And even if it was just 1% of the online audience, that's 90,000 people. That is double the annual visitation to physical visitation to Katma. So even if we had to scale it down, if the, um, you know, if the survey isn't quite reflective of the whole bear cam audience, um, it's still a significant number of people that we happen to be reaching. And do the, do the interpretive programs work? Uh, you know, how do they um, impact people's uh, bear viewing experience and their connection to the bears. When asked, it, did it improve the bear cam viewing experience? Uh, different surveys, so again, different scale. Um, one disagree, seven strongly agree. All of the numbers on these questions are up near six. So 6.2 for that first question. It improved the bear cam viewing experience. Made conserving nature seem more important, uh, six out of seven. Made me value nature conservation more same level, made me want to talk about what I heard, made conservation seem more justifiable, increased confidence, everything is being done to conserve these bears, and increased confidence in the National Park Service's ability, uh, excuse me, increased confidence in the National Park Service wildlife conservation efforts. So all around six out of seven for those uh, questions. The only one actually that I would like to see a lower number on is second from the bottom here, Increased confidence, everything is being done to conserve these bears because not everything is being done to conserve these bears, especially when you consider the impacts of climate change, um, ocean acidification on salmon, and the, really the whole experience at Katmai, the bear watching experience, is dependent on salmon. And so when you think about that, you think about the threats that Pebble Mine uh, poses to the region in large scale development, not everything is being done to conserve these bears. But of course, inside of the park, you know, the bears are very well protected. So this is a, um, a wake-up call for me that maybe I need to do a better job explaining some of the threats um, to, the bear, uh, to the bears at Katmai and the salmon. And, you know, uh, the, the, so evidence is building over time through surveys that the webcam experience is very powerful and online interpretive efforts can be very effective and increasing appreciation, awareness, and support for national parks. And that's why I want to encourage everybody to get online, take the leap, get a little uncomfortable, get online, and take the leap into online interpretation. What is online interpretation? Online interpretation basically is the same thing 
as regular interpretation. It's the methods and philosophy of heritage interpretation extended to audiences over the internet. So it's really kind of like the same thing that you would do at your park, except you're talking to an online audience. There's a lot of similarities. Your interpretive purpose remains the same. Your, your goal is to forge meaningful connections and meaningful experiences for the audience. You want to use engaging techniques and you want to meet the interests of the audience. So a lot of similarities. At the same time, there are some differences. And I think these differences are actually advantages. One is that you can uh, have a continuous long-term conversation with your audience. Instead of just a, a few people stopping by your evening program and then going home and you're never talking to them again, you're talking to an online audience over not only just days, but weeks, seasons, and years. Some of the Bear Cam audience have been watching since the Bear Cams went live. And so they have a very thorough knowledge of the park. And we can talk about maybe different things than I would talk about with somebody who's just experiencing the webcam for the first time. So we're getting a, you, you have a, a, an opportunity for a continuous long-term conversation. You can develop an established trust and rapport with your audience. And that was, when I, when I was doing programs with people uh, you know, at parks, an evening program or a talk at a visitor center or a guided hike or whatever it was, that pre-program portion of the, of the of the program, that 10 to 15 minutes when your audience is just arriving was the most difficult for me. I'm a terrible mingler. And maybe if you tried to get my attention during this, this conference, I probably was walking with my head down because I'm, I'm terrible at it. Um, but you can, you can establish your trust and rapport over time through the webcams because you're there fre frequently. The audience tunes in, they recognize your face. Um, so that's, that's a big advantage. And then, of course, um, you can engage your on-site audience before they arrive and after they leave, too. So again, very different from the regular you know, National Park Service style of interpretation where people come to your program and they leave and maybe they don't have an opportunity to engage with you again. You can engage the on-site audience before and after their visit. And you have a potential for a wor worldwide audience. And then whatever you do online stays online. So they can be good and bad. <laughs> So don't mess up, uh, don't embarrass yourself too much. There are some embarrassing things on the internet of me. You get used to it over time. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, whatever you do stays there. So it's a recorded, uh, it's a repository of knowledge for, that people can go back to uh, uh, throughout you know, days, years, and seasons. And how do we do online interpretation through the bear cams, through explore.org? Well, one of our classic methods of doing this is just what, what we call a live chat, where it's either myself or um, park staff getting online and talking about you know something that's of interest uh, to the online audience. Uh, this is a live chat where I um, am introducing Leslie Scora, who is the park's wildlife biologist. I like to get Leslie on the camera each year to talk about the bear monitoring program and her research at the park. The, um, so you can get biologists on the cameras with you, have interviews with them, answer audience questions. So these are our more uh, classic live chats. We um, also cover topics um, associated with like uh, bear behavior, uh, the dom uh, bear dominance and the hierarchy we talk about, bear fishing styles, mothers and cubs, a lot of the things that people are seeing on the cameras throughout the summer season. We try every once in a while to get people into different places that they wouldn't be able to physically experience even if they were at Brooks River, like taking people down into the river. This is one of, the more, one of my more favorite live chats that they've done. This is Ranger Landis Euler, who is now at Capitol Reef National Park, a very skilled interpreter, um, demonstrating and talking about how bears fish the jacuzzi, the plunge pool, below Brooks Falls. So um, live chats can take people into locations that they wouldn't normally be able to experience. And then also, one of the um, other uh, live, chat, live programs that we like to do are what I like to call play-by-plays. So broadcast like a sporting event where I am narrating the bear and salmon activity at Brooks Falls. And it's a little weird to see my face that big, so I'm gonna to skip to the next thing because what's on the other side of this camera is this is what people are generally seeing. So I'm behind the camera, I'm hooked up to the webcams, and I'm narrating the bear and salmon activity. Uh, you know, this is not a game for them. We call, it, we call them play-by-plays, but it's not a game for the bears, right? This is real, it's real life, it's survival to them. But it's helping people understand 
of the behavior and the biology of the bears in the moment. Remarkable interpretive opportunities. You really don't know what you're going to talk about. Uh, so it just looks like there's a few bears just kind of standing around right now. But the, on the far wall here, those are two very large adult male brown bears that are posturing, trying to establish dominance over one another. And we watched this for 10 or 15 minutes or so. So I was trying to utilize that as an interpretive moment to talk about conflict and, um, and competition in the bear world. And these are big dudes. Um, that, that darker bear on the right in the fall is estimated to be about 1,400 pounds. He is a big, big bear. Um, and later on in this broadcast, we saw these two bears get into a very intense fight. One of the most intense fights that I've ever witnessed. And it was happening live during this broadcast. So just a remarkable interpretive opportunity when you can try to bring, you know, when you can get on camera and talk about what is happening live in your park. So, you know, it's, it, I think these are engaging for the audience, but of course, we always have to be careful not to inflict interpretation on anybody. But with the webcams, it's, a, it's easy. If people don't want to listen to you, they don't have to listen to you. They just mute the sound or they turn it off. Um, or they flip to a webcam feed where maybe you're not there. So, and, and if you're doing live broadcast on Facebook or other social media, that's, it's an easy, you know, it, it, that works the same uh, in those, uh, under those um, platforms. The written word, I think, is very important uh, as well. Uh, so not only live video broadcasts, but try to think about ways to utilize um, blog posts, social media. Don't think of social media as just sharing pictures. Again, it's online interpretation. You're looking to forge connections for people that aren't physically visiting your site. So using blog posts to talk about um, the biology and the behavior of bears, using blog posts to talk about the issues uh, that national parks face with crowding and uh, wildlife viewing ethics. That's a topic that I try to tackle frequently on the bear accounts. I think I would be negligent in my duties if I didn't uh, do that. And then getting in the comments. One of the, um, one of the more important things that we can do, uh, on, or excuse me, one of, the, one of the things that I'm really fortunate to be able to do through Explorador is just get into the comments. And let me jump down here for just a moment and get my mouse pointer up. This is what people are talking about right now live on the cams. So, um, so the people are just talking about the bears, um, the bald eagles that they're seeing. Um, this is a community. It's like a, it's like a virtual campfire where people can go, they can post their comments, they can share their experiences. One of the more powerful techniques um, that we can utilize through online interpretation is talking about individuals. And with wildlife, I know sometimes that can be a bit controversial, but I encourage actually people on the bear cams to get to know the individual bears. So if you have wildlife at your park, utilize those individual stories. You know, whether or not they're, they have a nickname or a number, that doesn't really matter or so. But if you can talk about, um, you know, it's even better if you do, can identify that individual over you know, days or seasons or whatever it happens to be. But if you can talk about those individual stories, those stories are used, it can be used to help people connect with larger you know, populations of, of wildlife because it's really hard for people to connect with populations. It's much easier for people to connect individually with the animals that they see and they can learn more about. In fact, um, in the survey this summer, we asked the question, do you have a favorite brown bear that you like to watch? And 50% of people said yes that they do. In fact, a lot of them said yes because of this bear. This is number 480 Otis. He's one of the most famous bears in the world. He's recognizable, he's at the falls a lot. He's against that far wall. And people like watching this bear, not because he's more important than other bears, but because of the, again, the stories that he tells about the bear world. The fact that he um, practices good energy economics. He's a very skilled and patient angler. So he doesn't expend a lot of energy to make a living. I think people admire that. They, can, they see connections maybe in their own lives. Uh, he also is uh, an older bear. He is well over 20 years old. He's approaching his mid-20s. He faces a lot of competition from younger bears. He's so far been persevering through that. He suffers from ailments like missing teeth, worn teeth, and maybe other injuries, but he's persevering through that. So people are, are able to connect with this bear specifically, and a lot of the other bears at Brooks River through those individual stories. And they know that, hey, if Otis is patient like this, then other bears 
might be doing the same thing. This is just one way that they make a living. And in fact, what's an example of somebody, you know, that one person said about Otis, um, one person, to give you an example when it, uh, of how they connected to Otis, uh, this person commented, you want to know one of the reasons why I like Otis so much? He's got a really good work ethic. He shows up for work every day, nose to the grindstone, productive, focused, gets along well with his coworkers, and minds his own beeswax. And so he's not one that gets in a lot of fights, probably because he's just an older dude, and he knows, hey, I just need to stay out of this. I can make my living in my own way. Uh, but people connect really strongly with the individual. So if you can utilize that through your online interpretive efforts, I think your online interpretive efforts will be more effective. And you can use the individual as well to talk about, again, the biology of bears overall. Fat Bear Week in Katmai is an incredibly successful online campaign for the park. It's something we started um, in 20. 14 and 2015, did anybody vote in Cat Cat Fat Bear Week this year? Just one person? Oh, people, okay. <laughs> um, Fat Bear Week is uh, a March Madness style bracket um, where you get to pick who you think is the fattest bear can bear of the year. And it's just pictures of fat bears showing skinny pictures from early in the season and late in the season to demonstrate how much weight they need to gain to survive Hibernation. It's also an opportunity to uh, discuss and explore the richness and productivity of Katmai's ecosystem, and you may be able to utilize similar stories in your own national parks. Uh, so the final this year was between Holly at the top and Lefty at the bottom. Holly ended up winning, so she's the 2019 Fat Bear Week champion. I uh, expect everybody, yes, good, good for Holly. She's a, a successful bear, um, you know, and again, fat, demonstrates success in the bear world. So that's an opportunity for us to uh, engage with different audiences in different ways, utilizing these stories of these individuals. And you can talk about, again, the, um, you know, how each one of these bears makes a living in different ways. Lefty is an adult male who um, fishes in different ways than Holly. Uh, has his, the fat reserves that he has means different things to him. He may need those fat reserves in the springtime to fuel his pursuit of mating opportunities. Well, Holly, maybe, you know, she may have cubs in the den this winter. So she may need those fat reserves, not only for herself, but to ensure the survival of her cubs in the den. Because in the den, bears don't eat, drink, urinate, or defecate. And they nurse their young. They, lack, they give birth and they lactate while hibernating. They're the only mammals that can do this. So different aspects of their biology, different ways to interpret uh, their world. Of course, with webcams, you're not, especially with animals, you're not just demonstrating and interpreting the good things uh, in, in nature, but you also have to be prepared for when things go bad, when things don't go well for the wildlife that people see. This is a screenshot of a mother bear and her two yearling cubs. The one lying prone on the ground is in the process of dying. We watched this happen over two days on the bear cams. Thousands of people are watching this with us. So this is what I call, again, and it's a kind of a, a cautionary note for webcams, it's what I call an interpretive emergency. Drop what, when stuff like this happens, drop what you're doing, get online to help the audience understand what's going on. Understand park policy, because we didn't interfere in this situation. I was still a ranger at Katmai at the time, um, so I was helping to explain park policy about when it's appropriate to intervene and when it's not. And in this situation, we chose not to because it looked like it was a natural event. And it was. The, uh, the, after the cub died and the mother left, um, the cub was collected for necropsy. The webcam footage um, and some of the observations that the, the online audience captured was used by the wildlife veterinarian um, to diagnose the cub with canine adenovirus, and that's probably what it ended up um, dying from. It was a difficult situation for people to watch. It was a difficult situation to interpret. I do think it was largely a successful interpretive opportunity though, because the park really didn't get a lot of negative flack. And you can imagine if we had just let this go and we were not online, we were not transparent with everything that we knew and we were flat out telling people we don't know. I think that was an important part of the process, constantly trying to update people. If we had not done those things, then I think it would have been a lot more difficult for, the part, or for people watching to understand what was going on. And we were doing our best also to try to 
try to focus people's need to help in a productive way. I mean, there was really, it's, it's frustrating when you see something, an animal that you care about, and you can't do anything for that animal. Uh, so I was feeling empathy for the people who wanted to step in, who wanted to help this cub. So we were trying to just do little things like, hey, count the cub's respirations every half hour. We're gonna see if it's improving or speeding up or if it's at a normal level or slowing down. Um, you know, again, capturing the webcam footage that the, the wildlife veterinarian could use in the future. So think about ahead of time, how can you utilize people's need to help in a productive way when things go wrong uh, on the webcams? And follow up afterwards with what you know and, and what you don't know. Uh, so with blog posts, with, um, with live chats, whatever it happens to be, that's an important part of that process when, when things aren't pleasant to see on, on the webcams. Overall though, I, I do think that online interpretation and webcams are extremely important. There are some cautionary notes. There, it's, a, it's an effective process, but there are some things that you wanna be cautious of overall, such as webcam popularity may lead to higher visitation. Uh, you know, that's, that's something that national parks are grappling with. It's just not Katmai, it's just not Brooks River, it's almost every national park is grappling with skyrocketing visitation. And parks somehow, some way, are gonna have to tackle this issue. Um, but with the increased, you know, again, popularity of your site online that may draw more people to those sites. So again, a cautionary note. Streaming webcams demand full-time attention. So just don't put a webcam up of an osprey or an eagle nest or of a bears at a waterfall and expect everything to just be fine. You need to pay attention to what's going on in the webcam and the needs of the audience. So it is a full-time job. Increased notoriety creates, of course, increased demand for information. People are gonna wanna know what's going on in the park. Be as transparent with them as possible. And webcam viewers are people too. Uh, sometimes we think of our online audience as not as important as the on-site visitors, but you really should be treating the online audience the same as somebody who's standing in front of you at the visitor center desk. So treat them like they are um, like they're standing in front of you. And then, again, focus people's need to help in a productive way when they wanna help. So think about how you can do that and prepare for that. One of the questions that I do get frequently, and I know probably some of you are thinking this, is, well, Mike, it's not feasible for everyone to put up a webcam and partner with an outside organization and get webcam streaming and hire more staff and all of this stuff, and I understand that. But there are a bunch of other platforms that allow you to get online and do live online interpretation. Each one of these platforms has a, a streaming option. The captioning services on these has actually gotten really good over the last few years, so the technology is improving tremendously for captioning. So for those people who may be hearing impaired, um, you know, you can meet those accessibility standards. For um, people who might be um, you know, visually impaired, you're looking to meet the, uh, the standards for audio descriptions, you can work that into your live events by describing what you're doing, what you're seeing. And that's something that I need to do a better job with personally, is describing where I am, what I'm doing, what's behind me. And I actually didn't do that at the beginning of this talk. I should have said, here I am in this room with this stage. I mean, you can work it in um, in, a, in a variety of different ways. But each one of these streaming services or each, each one of these social media platforms has a live streaming option available to you. So again, if, if a full webcam isn't you know, feasible maybe for you right now, then consider these other options. Because in the, in the wake of, you know, again, a climate change and extinction, national parks are really more important than ever before. They're important for the stories they tell, the experiences, that they provide to people, the ecosystems and the wildlife that they harbor. But the, way, the, the national park experience for the last 100 plus years has not been an inclusive ex experience. People still experience many barriers to visiting national parks, especially parks like Katmai, which are remote, expensive, and difficult to get to. And then when people do visit these places, there's a paradox where you're coming in close contact with wildlife and you can alter the behavior and the movements of the animals. You can impact the resources in a negative way. So again, the paradigm doesn't work for everybody. The paradigm of park visitation uh, 
creating stewardship doesn't work for everybody because not everybody can visit this place. And then there's also that paradox of visitation. But webcams can bridge the barriers that prevent people from visiting national parks and they can offer some relief from the paradox. They are not, again, solutions to all of these issues, but they can be a part of the solution overall. And I'm not just the only person who thinks this. For example, E.O. Wilson in his book Half, Half Earth had this to say. He said, I suggest a means to achieve almost free enjoyment of the world's best places in the biosphere. The cost benefit ratio would be extremely small. It requires only a thousand or so high resolution cameras that broadcast live around the clock from sites within reserves. People would still visit any reserve in the world physically, but they could also travel there virtually and in continuing real time. With species identifications and brief expert commentaries unobtrusively added, the adventure would be forever changing and safe. So E.O. Wilson, you know, he, he's a serious conservation biologist, you know, one of, the, one of the giants of conservation biology. And Half Earth is not one of those pick-me-up books, <laughs> in my opinion. I don't know if anybody's read it, um, but it is, it's, a, it's a lot about how the state of the, bio, uh, of the biosphere is not, in, it's not in good shape. But this was, a, a, again, a gem of, of positivity within that, that book overall. And when we think about, you know, again, the on-site experience, the physical experience of, of visiting our national parks, that's often perceived to be more powerful than an online experience. And for many people, it may be. Webcams and online interpretation are not a substitute for a physical visit. But evidence continues to mount that the online experience can create connections that are just as strong as an on-site visit, and they can garner support for national parks and conservation areas and wildlife that are on par with an on-site visit. Webcams and online interpretation make parks accessible to everybody. They allow and promote ethical wildlife viewing. They forge connections equivalent to on-site visits. And they, prov they provide interpreters with an unprecedented reach and platform. Now, when I took this picture about 10 years ago, this is, I think, a picture from 2009, I was watching, you know, 10, 20 bears up at Brooks Falls. And I was there with just a few other people. It was a remarkable experience for me, standing on the wildlife viewing platform, very meaningful experience uh, for me overall. But why should this just be limited to the people who can physically visit this site? I argue it shouldn't, and it doesn't have to. Through webcams and through online interpretation, we can help people around the world connect with these places like never before. We can break the paradigm and we can find respite from the visitation paradox through webcams and online interpretation. Webcams can be your gateway to creating a more inclusive and relevant park experience for everyone. Thanks for joining me today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, sir. Was there some significance to uh, that uh, bear swimming on its back, or is that just an interesting color? Just an interesting thing. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that gift, that's, um, that's number 503. Uh, yeah, and he's a, a very young, playful adult male right now. I think his uh, priorities will shift as he matures into a larger adult. But yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a fun bear to watch. And he's actually a bear with a very unique story. He's one of those bears that we interpret on the webcams. Frequently. So yeah, if you were wondering what that question was, uh, uh, so I can repeat it in case you didn't hear, the gif of the bear in, on his back um, playing in the water, that was just um, you know, um, what, what he was asking about. Yes, sir. Yeah, so a um, uh, question about the new elevated bridge at Brooks River. Um, that's a... a how does it affect the visitor experience and the bears? I, I wish I had two hours to talk about it. Is that, um, it's, it's a complicated issue. Um, uh, this year, um, well, to make a long story short, um, there was for, 
for several decades, two, uh, three decades, four decades at least, um, a floating bridge across Brooks River. Um, and there was also always a lot of bears next to the bridge, uh, or not always, but frequently bears near the bridge, and you couldn't approach the bridge when a bear was within 50 yards, the, um, just to give the bear space more than anything else. Um, and it caused a lot of delays, people getting back and forth. Some people were frustrated with it, others didn't think it was that big of a deal. Um, but the park um, built this year a multi-million dollar elevated walkway above Brooks River itself. And I was there at Brooks River this summer for about six weeks. So I got to see the experience uh, that people were having um, at, at the river with this new elevated bridge. And I, as a ranger there in the past, I managed people at, at the river before the elevated bridge. So I know kind of what both experiences are, are like now. Um, the, the bridge, I will say, has its benefits. It is more convenient for people, certainly, to go back and forth over the river. I don't think it solves a lot of the issues that Brooks River um, is, is facing, um, especially associated with, um, with increasing visitation patterns. People still have free access to the river itself, so I don't really think it substan substantively reduces bear and human conflict along the river corridor overall. I think park man some park managers are going to disagree with me on that, and they're going to push back, and that's fine. Um, but yeah, I don't think um, I, I think the bridge is good in, in some ways, but I think the park needs to take it a step further and and work for protections for brown bears that might be in the river itself overall. And I'd be happy to talk to you more about that afterwards. Yeah, and I'll be here, you know, the rest of the day um, if anybody has any other questions for me. But um, thanks for joining the, uh, the talk today, and I hope to see everybody online at your own parks doing some online interpretation.